webinar series, please note the talk will be recorded and the QR section will be live for two days following the seminar. Today, we're really glad to have uh, Professor Peter Hunter, Director of the EBA, to kick off the 12 labor cinema series by presenting an overview of the 12 labor project and modeling. Uh, Peter, research interests include modeling human physiology. He is an ele elected fellow of the Royal Society, both UK and uh, New Zealand. He is also executive chair of the World Council of Biomechanics and the vice president of International Union of Physiological Science, the uh, IUPS. Without further ado, I better let Peter start his talk. Uh, Peter, ready when you are. Thanks. Thanks, Jichao. Kia ora tato, everyone. Um, in case you're wondering what the term, where the term 12 labors comes from, I thought I should just um, explain that it's the 12, the body has 12 organ systems. So that's the origin of the, of the 12 labors uh, project. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background to this before I talk specifically about the 12 labors. I thought it's worth setting the scene for anyone on the call who is not aware of some of the background work um, that ABI has been doing over many years. Um, and part of the ABI has been very involved in something called the Physiome Project, which is developing a multi-scale modeling framework that allows us to go all the way from molecules to cells upwards to the body. Um, and developing standards around encoding models at the cell tissue organ level um, in a robust reproducible fashion. And this has led to um, development of the um, Salomel model repository, Physio model repository, which has got nearly a thousand uh, models um, on it. And also recently to the Physio journal, which is a, a journal that allows um, that encourages reproducible modeling by providing a venue for modelers to um, demonstrate reproducibility of their of their model. Um, but a lot of the and a lot of the work done by many people in the ABI over many years has been focused on building finite element models, in this case the heart, for example, or the lungs, musculoskeletal system, or the gut, etc. Um, but usually with a focus on understanding tissue um, to function. So as shown here, for example, the, um, by solving the physics of, in this case, mechanics, but likewise for electrophysiology or, or coupled into fluid mechanics, um, by solving the physics and understanding the material properties, we can get an understanding of how organs function and link down to tissue structure, tissue properties, and, the, and down to cell level properties. But very much with a focus on quite complex multi-scale models of individual organs. And that's, that's been applied across quite a wide range of organ systems now, of, of organs rather. And um, as I'll explain in a minute, we're, we're trying now to bring all that to bear on, in a more integrated fashion in the whole body. Um, I just want to give an illustration of um, the way that a molecular event can affect whole organ function in, in a very dramatic way um, and very, very quickly. So this is a video of a pig heart contracting, and you'll see um, an, uh, several normal heartbeats. And then what you'll see is the effect of a simple modulation of the autonomic nervous system to the heart, which then has a dramatic effect in terms of slowing, in this case, slowing the heart. Um, and this is a video courtesy of Jeff Adele at UCLA, which is a group that we're working with um, as part of the Spark uh, project that I'll talk about in a minute. The, the electrodes you can see on the heart there, are, I'm not making use of that, but it's recording electrical activity at the same time as, as getting a video of the um, beating heart. So here we go. So you see the very fast beats of the heart and then bang, it slowed right down just by a single signal sent through the autonomic system to change its, um, change the activity of these, of the pacemaker of the heart. And it's just a, a nice illustration of, 
of the coupling between the heart, like all organs, is under constant modulation by the autonomic system. And it's very impressive how, how um, finely tuned that modulation of organ function can be and how rapid it can be. So over the last five years, we've been funded by an NIH project called SPARC to map the autonomic system. So this is autonomic system, nervous system means the nerves in the body that are not under your voluntary control, but rather are responding to various senses and sending signals um, to the various organs in the body, partly to coordinate the function of those organs um, and to adapt to changes, you know, when you suddenly need to accelerate the heart, breathe faster, et cetera, for exercise. Um, and every organ in the body, every visceral organ has this intimate level of control by the autonomic system. So what we've been doing under NIH funding and working with many experimental groups around the world, particularly in the US, is to bring that understanding of the connectivity and, the, and all sorts of sources of data on the autonomic system into a common framework um, and develop interfaces for, for, for linking to those data and models. And part of it has been dealing with the connectivity shown here through what we call flat maps. And I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate this a bit more right at the end, but um, also developing scaffolds. And part of the, the idea of these scaffolds is that they give you a high level description of the anatomy of an organ. Um, you can refine those meshes and export them for computation, um, but the scaffold itself is providing a three-dimensional material coordinate system framework for being able to um, register individual data um, and or across species data. So in the case of Spark, data is coming in from lots of different species, mouse, rat, pig, human, etc. And you need to be able to compare data sets across species. So we need a, a common coordinate reference frame for doing that comparison. And e even for the colon, which varies enormously between a mouse, a pig, and a human, um, by building subscaffolds that allow us to define the particular characteristics of the colon for a given species, we can create a single common reference frame that allows comparison of data across these different uh, species. And then here's some examples of bringing neural data in the stomach into the scaffold, um, or in this case, the vasculature of the, the colon um, for the mouse into the scaffold environment. So the key things that have come out of the um, Spark project that are relevant for 12 labors are this idea of using 3D scaffolds to register data in a common coordinate framework. Um, from comparing the variation across individuals in the population and for cross-species comparison. And then the use um, of a single knowledge base for semantic metadata that allows data to be retrieved and displayed on query. So this is, we've really pioneered this in combination with a group at uh, UCSD um, for the Spark project, and we will be um, building on that for the 12 labors. Um, Okay, so let's now move to 12 labors. Um, and the goals are to extend the Physiome project to the clinic and to home-based healthcare with a much more integrative whole body approach. So it's taking all the work that many people in the ABI have been doing over many years, but trying to bring it into a framework that allows us to apply, to apply it to the clinic, both by integrating into whole body systems and by um, dealing with issues of um, model reduction and thinking about how we can provide much faster linkage between the very detailed models that the various ABI groups are, are developing and how that gets used in the clinic where you need often real-time um, function. And then we also are coupling to wearable and plantable home-based diagnostic devices and therapeutic um, where, you know, just in recognition that the, in many cases the future of healthcare is going to depend more and more on, on monitoring um, devices, and in some cases implanted. And the implantable devices group at the ABI has been developing long-term stable pressure measurement with implanted sensors, um, with um, inductive power transfer for powering 
and, and wireless transmission. And we'll be exploiting that as part of the 12 labors, um, as part of um, some of the projects that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but one of the key aspects to the whole project is the need for a, a new mathematical framework for understanding physiology that we are really hoping to pioneer with the 12 labors project, which has got to be energy-based. Um, and I'll talk more about that. Um, but it's also got to be semantically based. We've got to be able to deal with complexity by, by creating modules that are, are properly annotated, curated, documented, and then linked semantically to build more complex models from, from well-validated uh, modules. So it's really a high throughput approach to, to modeling. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in, in this talk. Um, I mean, this talk is just the first of a number that will follow. And the next one, in fact, is going to be by um, Prasad, who's going to be talking about the, the clinical workflows. Um, uh, but this one, I'm going to focus particularly on the, the mathematical frameworks behind the 12 Labors project. So here are the 12 Labors AIs. So um, again, building, bringing groups together. So Merrin's work in the lungs with Marty's work on the heart, et cetera. And um, also coupling into these um, technology platforms that I'll talk about in a second. We have a bunch of postdocs um, on the project and also Salomal curators and um, Dana's the project manager. So here's the overall structure. Um, we want to build three platforms. It's a five-year project. So we're, we're 10 months into this five-year project. Um, so platform one is about a, a framework for personalized physio modeling um, and is dealing with all the multi-scale models that I've been talking about and, and I'll talk more about in a minute. Platform two is around the clinical workflows. Um, platform three and about bringing models into those clinical workflows. Platform three are the devices, the wearable, implantable, et cetera, devices and coupling those into the modeling frameworks. But to, to demonstrate the way that these platforms will work, we've got three exemplar projects. And I mean, we could have chosen a whole range of different projects, but we wanted to focus on ones that would particularly bring groups within the ABI who've previously not worked very closely together to bring them together, to really force this um, collaboration where we think about integration of organs because most chronic diseases depend on multiple organ systems and we've got to be able to understand homeostasis in the body, understand how the body works as an integrative whole, um, as well as coupling in our detailed knowledge of individual organs. Um, so, you know, we're planning to bring in other future projects into these pipelines, but testing the pipelines out with these three exemplar projects, one on pulmonary hypertension, one on which is led by Merrin and Marty, one on upper limb rehabilitation led by Tor, and one on the autonomic control of organ function, both for maternal health um, around uterine modeling and also for digestive work that the um, GI group and ABI has been doing. So led by uh, Leo on the digestive side and Alice on the, um, on the uh, woman's health side. Um, and then there's a number of, because this is an MB funded grant, there's a number of outcomes that, and outputs that are in line with what uh, MB want out of funding these sort of grants. It's funded by the international aspect of MB and so it's, it's a catalyst grant. So it's got a very strong um, link with uh, international groups. And we've got a, a quite a substantial international advisory group behind it, which we had our first meeting of um, a couple of days ago. Um, and there will be commercial outcomes from this, um, but the, the main body is open science designed to bring in, leverage other international opportunities to really, to try and provide a platform that can be used worldwide for addressing these clinical issues. And of course, we want to exploit locally our opportunities for commercial outcomes as well. Um, so here's a, a quick overview of some of the workflows. Um, so the Physio and Project models that I've talked about are in Physio Model Repository using these standards, Salomal and Fieldamal. Um, those, as I've mentioned, are 
closely often linked with image processing through MR, CT, et cetera, um, for, for building personalized models that based on MR, CT data that then allow the finite element models to be adjusted to an individual. Um, and as you can see here for all three exemplar projects um, and also for functional data from various uh, clinical sources of functional data. So we're still going to be very much dependent on those detailed tissue level um, models that bring imaging data together with knowledge of tissue function and linking down to cell types, but increasingly trying and building databases both for the individual and for populations, but increasingly trying to bring all this into a more standardized clinical workflow across all of these exemplars and, and other, other examples later um, using model reduction techniques. And that in some cases that's machine learning approaches with surrogate models. In other cases, it's using bond graph approaches that I'll talk about um, that allow us to get much more, um, much faster models that, that, um, that, that couple back to the, the detailed models. And then, of course, bringing in all the wearable and plantable data um, that's going to in increasingly in the future provide very important sources of data for managing healthcare, particularly for chronic diseases. And then a really important part of 12 Labors is closing the loop on clinical input. So being able to use these models in a framework that provides the analysis and clinical advice, but um, feeding back, we're working with a company called The Clinician on patient reported outcomes, linking back into electronic health records and being able to really try and integrate these models into clinical uh, workplace systems. And uh, as I mentioned, Prasad will talk a lot more about this in the next um, of the series of these uh, seminars. So there are the three platforms, platform one on the modeling framework, two, platform two on the clinical workflows and platform three on the, um, the wearable and plantable home-based devices. So talking first about platform one um, and I've talked about the, the Physiome project, but the Physiome is very much dealing with multi-scale issues and we now have the Salomel framework. But what we're dealing, what we're needing to increasingly deal with now is bringing models together into composite models through appropriate annotation of the component models. And we're calling these functional cell units. Um, and I'll describe one of those in more detail in a minute. And likewise, at the tissue level, functional tissue units. I mean, physiology really emerges from molecular biology um, at the level of around um, typically um, submillimeter in one dimension and of the order of two or 300 microns in the other dimension. And that's right across the board, whether it's um, function as seen in the lung through a lung asinus and the alveoli, through a bone osteon, et cetera, et cetera, kidney nephron, that function emerges as a physiological function that gets scaled up to the whole organ function, um, but is really the, the key physiological functions integration of a relatively small number of cell types um, at the level of these functional tissue units. And then you're just scaling up to deal with the, the magnitude of, of exchange needed in the nephron or, or gas exchange in the lungs and so on or the volume of blood needed for the body size in the case of the heart. Um, so a lot of the focus of child labors is, is from a modeling perspective is going to be on creating these functional cell units linked to functional tissue units. And I'll try, try and give a more, um, more of a detailed explanation of what I mean by that here. And then that'll feed into the, the work um, that a number of groups are doing at the whole organ level and then through to the whole body level where we've got to be thinking a lot about homeostatic mechanism, feedback control. I mean, the circulation obviously is one mechanism for um, integrating across organs, but likewise the autonomic nervous system and the lymphatic system are all part of the integration of these organs into the, into the whole body physiology. Um, so, and as I've said, the Spark project has given us now the um, a lot of um, a good 
had you know good start in getting an integrated system through the autonomic system, but also dealing with integrated data um, through interfaces that allow us to use a, a single knowledge base to be able to retrieve information, both data and models um, in an anatomical context for building uh, composite uh, models. And the scaffolds again, I've mentioned, but dealing with these across a much wider range of organs than um, has been dealt with in the Spark project. And then here, for example, is, a, is an example of bringing um, a lot of individual cell level RNA-seq data together into appropriate spatial locations in the scaffolds um, in relation to autonomic control in the heart. Um, and then also part of 12 Labors is going to be building on what we've been doing in the Spark project. Um, and this is some of the work that Elias has been doing in the Spark project on and, and very much Richard's development of these 3D scaffold frameworks for, um, for 3D coordinate systems where we want the ability to automatically insert the organs into whole bodies based on fiducial markers of these organs um, and be able to create automated pipelines to um, assemble whole bodies from detailed knowledge of organs and the connectivity across bodies so that we can create population groups for clinical trial, virtual clinical trials. So both retain the ability to, to model the integrative function of an individual, but also to create these um, composite um, or, or population databases for virtual clinical trials. And I mean, a lot of this is gonna very much depend on the, we've got a fabulous, um, team in the ABI in terms of building the tools for enabling a lot of this. And, you know, there's some very sophisticated tools now for being able to build the scaffolds to keep them as individual scaffolds that handling multiple sources of data, but build these into com composite models that can be, depending on the function being in, looked at, can be integrated into um, whole, whole body models. Um, as appropriate for the particular questions, clinical questions being asked. And, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. So now going back to the cell level, um, the, the functional cell unit is going to be really critical in this whole 12 labors approach. So it's got, we've got to be saying, we know the genome, you know, it's a huge advantage that, that, um, that science has now given us the, the sequence for the genome, um, which codes for all proteins. Um, but thanks to machine learning now, of course, we also have the, the protein structure for all the proteins coded by the, the genome, um, which is a very relatively recent breakthrough. But what we need to be doing is to be creating the, the, the little units, the salomel um, function of every protein, of every ion channel, transporter, um, everything that's involved in cellular function, we need to be adding, creating small cellular models that capture the function in the same way that the protein databases captures the, the protein structure. Why not have a database where we capture the, the function through models of all of these proteins and then assemble those, have the ability to, as cellular provides, to automatically assemble based on annotations, assemble those components, um, in this case, this particular module showing all the, the various ion channels and exchanges necessary to generate an action potential um, in an electrically excitable cell. So the module then becomes the, the composite of all these individual ion channels. And likewise for pH control and um, work that uh, Shelley now is doing with modules for some of the key signal, uh, signaling platforms based on these key enzymes like adenyl cyclase, phospholipase C and guanyl cyclase. So for example, a module here, which is providing the, the connection between beta adrenergic signaling from the sympathetic system and the autonomic system and muscarinic um, signaling from the parasympathetic system via G protein coupled receptors that couple through to um, the enzyme that 
um, converts ATP to cyclic AMP, and then the second messenger that then phosphorylates all the proteins that are involved in um, electromechanical coupling, where there's a module for calcium transport um, that then links to the production of force, for example, um, for the myofilaments in both cardiac, skeletal, and um, smooth muscle. And so um, these, this modular approach based on automated imports, at, based on annotated models, properly curated, validated, annotated models, and then into a workflow that allows the automated assembly is going to be absolutely crucial for the for dealing with the, the complexity of what we're we're facing here. Um, and then the ability to then take those modules and build them into whole cell models um, based on bond graph formulation um, uh, for creating whole cell models that then get appropriately reduced depending on the function into models that go into tissue level and, and up to organ level behavior. So now I just want to explain in more detail how the, the bond graph modeling works for um, one particular component. So I'm going to focus on one that um, Shelley and I have been working on recently, which is the, the G protein coupled receptor, which lies behind the both beta adrenergic receptor signaling and muscarinic receptor signaling, and is in fact involved in a very wide range of signaling pathways. And this single receptor type, G protein coupled receptor, is in fact responsible for 50% of all drug targets. So it's a, it's a, and it, there's about 750 genes in the gene in the 23,000 genes in the human genome associated with coding associated with this protein um, or this protein complex rather. Um, and so what we've done now is to build a, a model that captures all the biophysical processes. Um, or we hope nearly all the biophysical processes involved in the function of G protein coupled receptors. And so the ligand, the, the beta adrenergic um, ligand binds here um, as a stimulus from sympathetic stimulation or circulating um, adrenaline and provides the outputs in the form of um, the G alpha GTP subunit that goes into the um, signaling for beta adrenergic signaling through to adenyl cyclase, or it goes into a, also produces the G beta gamma subunit that's involved in other signaling pathways. Um, and so once you have the, the basic um, biochemistry figured out from the literature of how this module works, then we can, um, then we can build a bond graph model and this is going to increasingly rely, Jagir is building tools that will plug into Ellen's open core for um, much more automated building of these bond graph models. But the real beauty of bond graphs is that we, you go from here to here in a relatively straightforward way, but in a way that guarantees that the model you build conserves mass, conserves charge, conserves energy. And that's absolutely vital if these models are being used over long time frames and being coupled into composite integrative models, they have to be able to be demonstrated to conserve the law, obey the laws of physics properly. Biochemists typically don't worry about energy conservation, but that is a mistake. It absolutely you have to conserve energy if you want these models to be useful in a whole body um, physiological sense. So physiology is all about physics, and at this level, the physics is conserving um, energy and conserving mass. So these bond graph frameworks allow you to do that automatically. Then you can automatically generate all the equations, the mass balance, the, the chemical potentials um, uh, through Boltzmann's laws that give you the relationship between concentrations and chemical potentials, and then the energy balance that comes um, from the one nodes and then the reaction schemes that, that allow you to build the, the, the flows of these quantities through the various reactions linked into the, the biochemical potentials. But all of those equations just pop out automatically from the bond graph formulation. And then 
the creation of the equations, the Salomal equations to solve an open core, again, is completely automatic from, from that bond graph. Um, and then you can then solve these and you know, they're very fast. This, this model is solving in well under a millisecond um, for looking at the response of that particular ligand to the downstream second messenger signaling. Um, so again, stressing the, the importance of, and, and I should just uh, a shout out really to the incredible work that um, David Nickerson, Andre has done in, in helping to build this framework that's used right around the world now, but for bringing the ability to create curated annotated models at the, um, at the subcellular level, import them into these composite models that then can automatically populate um, the, the level, the models, that, and this is a model by NEMA for um, epithelial cell transport. Um, and then link through to physio and papers that really document the whole process. But the starting point are these individual bond graph, bond graph based models of encoded in Salomel and available via a library in the physio model repository for people to combine in different ways, depending on the, on the use. Then moving to the functional tissue unit level, um, this is a, is a big challenge, but it's really critical to to 12 labors. We've got to be able to deal with the, the physics of what's going on in organs, um, where the, the finite element models that people like Marty, Merrin and others and Leo you know, and so on are developing are going to be crucial to really understanding how to make these functional tissue unit models. But what this one is an example of is saying, if you look at the heart, a lot of the key function of the heart comes in contraction comes from a cylindrical element um, with fiber, fibers that vary through the wall, the whole sheet, fiber sheet architecture is feeding into this. But a lot of the function comes from the contraction of a cylinder and the inflation, this, the axial stretch, the radial inflation and the axial twist of a cylinder. So if you, if you develop a model that's got, that maintains that kinematic simplicity of those, um, axial stretch, radial expansion, and axial twist, then you can derive a 1D model that you can solve an open core as a, as a bond graph model that then solves for stress equilibrium across the wall. And that takes, again, under well under a millisecond to solve. So then you could look at, and what we've done now is to build those um, functional tissue unit models for the cylindrical kinematically simple cylindrical model of ventricular function. And we're doing the same for the right ventricle. Um, and then to build that into, in this case, it's using Sarusha's whole body circulation model. So coupled to the circulation model where the FTU, the functional tissue unit model, its boundary conditions are changing depending on what part of the cardiac cycle you're in. So you're handling the valve behavior, but coupling into bond graph models of the whole circulation um, using open core as a solver and being able to give, give much, much faster um, solutions for cardiac function linked into whole body circulation function. What we've yet to solve is understanding how to go from the finite element models, do modal decomposition of those finite element models, and then appropriately align each individual mode with an appropriate um, functional tissue unit model to build back to that whole organ function. But I'm pretty confident we'll be able to do this in a way that gives us um, much, much faster solutions of, um, for clinical use. But we're always going back to be able to check and validate against the detailed uh, final element models. I think the same will happen with the musculoskeletal work. So building on all the work that, that uh, Tor, Bezier, and the and the MSK group at ABI have been doing. Um, we're hoping that the scaffold approaches will allow us to define the fascicular structure of muscle, link it to neural innovation, link it to model Salomal, bond graph based models of neural control um, uh, for these muscles, and then be able to look at joint function through much, much simpler functional tissue unit models 
that adequately define the mechanics of these muscles around joints, but allow us to couple down into to cell level and subcellular function. Um, always working with the groups that are looking at the detailed function through the, the detailed finite element modeling. But I think that the, the functional tissue unit is going to be key to bringing all of that work into these integrative whole body frameworks. And then bringing into the autonomic control environment that I've talked about for the autonomic nervous system and the, and the spark work that we've been doing. And then um, bringing all this together into models that bring the autonomic system, the vascular system, coupled in with representations of fast representations of the physics of what's going on inside individual organs into whole body um, bond graph based models that we can validate against the detailed models, but bring into, into um, understanding homeostasis, feedback control on homeostasis and into clinical workflows. So I'm going to I'm going to finish there, but I'm just going to switch out of PowerPoint and just talk about um, uh, one other aspect um, or, get, or show you the, the Spark framework that we're going to be using for, for 12 labors. But also, um, I think it's very important that we document everything we do in 12 labors um, through a book. And we're calling it the lab book. Um, and it's a we're hoping that this will become a definitive statement of all the, the multi-scale energy-based modeling framework that we're developing for 12 labors. And it'll be online. And hopefully as various groups, both within ABI and around the world contribute to this project, we'll keep it documented through this group. And I'll just um, quickly show you some of that uh, in a minute. So I'll just quit out of this. And finally, just before I quit out, acknowledgements. I mean, what I, the work I'm talking about is many, many people across many years of work at the ABI and with our international collaborators. So thank you. And let me just switch to uh, Um, so first of all, the portal. So um, I just wanted to illustrate the Spark portal. You can choose from various um, species here. I'm just, the one I'm showing is, is rat in this case, but what this gives you is a zoomable. It's based on the, the Google street map style, um, uh, where it's the work of Dave Brooks in terms of, um, and Alan Wu in terms of building interfaces that allow us to to zoom into at any level of detail, but also to create um, through the, the knowledge base of all the data that goes in and automatically creates the, the little icons that show you where this data are available um, to create the tags that allow you to delve into the data or models, but then also into the, um, the 3D models so that you can both be looking at the connectivity of information across a, a whole body model that you can delve at any level of resolution into, but you can also couple into full 3D where these can be animated and, and link into our um, whole organ work. Um, and then secondly, I was just going to show the, um, and by the way, that first one is available at spark.science is the website, and then you'll see the link with maps. Um, and then secondly, this um, book concept where we're producing, um, it's far, you know, a lot of these sections here are empty, but a number of them are getting filled very quickly. And this is providing us with the, the framework that the, um, the layout is not too good at the moment. We're going to probably switch to a, to a much more friendly way of viewing all of this, but I do see this as a way of being able to properly document all the mathematics behind all the models that we develop and also to provide um, user biologist friendly user interfaces into the modeling frameworks that we can use for teaching purposes. Um, so uh, this is at a very early stage, but I was keen that we get this framework set up very early on so that 
people can see where we're headed in terms of documenting the whole project in a very um, open science uh, sort of way. So I'm going to stop there and stop sharing so we can go to any questions. So thank you. Thank you, Peter. A really fantastic talk. Yeah, we have we have fifteen uh, close to fifteen minutes uh, for questions. Um, if you have questions, just um, you know raise the hand. We can see you. Peter, I probably just start one. Um, um, you know, in your Spark project, uh, it's really interesting. Um, um, you know, uh, but but I'm just thinking, is that possible? Um, kind of like a byproduct, provide information. Say, you know, like uh, people doing cardiac research, uh, say they probably want to know particular, you know, except except the human, some particularly animal, like you know, rabbit or dog, is actually good for hard uh, cardiac research. Is any, you know, kind of recommendation, you know, out of this spark to say, you know, when you're doing, like uh, say cardiac, you know, baby, you, you, if you cannot do on human, better use, you know, dog or cat, whatever, if you're doing lung, maybe you know, better use, uh, um, you know, pig or whatever. I'm mean, just saying, is, is I, I, I mean, for me at research, I, I feel quite uh, kind of useful. Um, um, yeah, so Spark, I think, Rick, Spark, the NIH, um, it's funded through the Common Fund project. The, the, they recognize the importance of dealing with different species because often, as you say, particular experiments are most appropriate on a given species. So that, that's the reason for wanting to develop these 3D coordinate frameworks to provide the common reference frame for bringing data together. And then it's becoming increasingly straightforward to develop scaffolds. Um, I mean, particularly with the, the work that Richard, is, Richard Christie has done in, in building the frameworks for these scaffolds to be able to create species specific versions based on the anatomy of that particular species so that we can do these comparisons across species and the knowledge base at the moment um, for spark has um, mouse rat pig human cat but there's no reason we can't be adding other um, other species and many many other data sets i mean there are and in, in, we're into year five of Spark, and this year is the first year where it's opening up to non-Spark investigators to upload data and into the curation annotation pipeline. Um, so we're hoping that that whole Spark framework will become a way of bringing data sources together for the autonomic system, um, a, a much beyond just Spark, and of course, much beyond the particular species that have so far been handled within Spark. Thank you, Peter. I see Gondola, uh, or Prasad, both of you, uh, probably Gondola first. Thanks, Peter, for the great talk. So I, I was going to ask you about if there is any plan for uh, standardizing the way that we couple the models, uh, mainly because of this compact, uh, this uh, context of multi-scale. The lower you go in the scale, then when you uplift your scale, you need to have each time richer and richer mathematics because you need to account for these micro phenomena that usually are higher order than projections when you go up. So I don't know if uh, there was any kind of discussion or thoughts how it's going to be coupled uh, different models that maybe they are different in terms of one is OD, the other one is PD and also in terms of scales that maybe something is linear and very basic on the micro scale, but when you go up, it starts to be higher order. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think Gonzalo, you're putting your finger on our biggest challenge. I think um, we, we know that, and from the work you've done, you've shown that the ability to, to produce using machine learning approaches to, and defining the state space that you're interested in for inputs and outputs to find the um, capture the behavior of a, of a very detailed um, Marty style of very detailed um, cardiac uh, work in a surrogate model that captures the function and, and is usable in a much faster environment. That's one approach and I think that will be vital for, for um, 12 labors, but also this, this functional tissue unit approach 
I think is going to be another way of trying to bridge scales. And I'm sure that the it's going to be both. It's not going to be either. It's going to be both. And but I think we're a long way away yet from really understanding um, how you know we've got lots to learn in terms of how we do that effectively. And it's going to be different for every organ too. I think how we bring those together. But that that really is our major challenge. Is exactly that. It's how to bring all of this detailed knowledge at the cell at multiple scales um, through the frameworks that we're creating into whole 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 organ and whole organ system, but particularly whole body physiologically relevant homeostatic mechanisms um, for for understanding the application to uh, to disease and to medical pipelines. But a big challenge. Thanks. Yeah, Prasad. Um, thanks, thanks, Peter. Really, really nice. Um, uh, it's really nice to see the the, the vision here. Um, I was just uh, I was just wondering regarding the knowledge bases. So there's there's um, I, and I was just wondering. So there's a there's a spark sort of knowledge base and. Perhaps there's a 12 labors knowledge base. I was wondering, is there, is there going to be a, I, I'm just wondering how these knowledge bases would be organized to, um, uh, you know, would they have the same, kind of the same information in there? Or is the plan to have a physio knowledge base that all of these kind of fall under? Just wondering your thoughts on that. I, I mean, I think we have to have, we're going to have a number of different databases and some of them with very different degrees of openness associated with them. Um, I think that the from a physiological perspective, the most important thing is that we're keeping all the physiological data from many, more, many different uh, species um, open and publicly accessible, freely available open, um, but curated and annotated in the way that we're doing for, for Spark. Um, I mean, increasingly, the funding agencies around the world, NIH, the Wellcome Trust, European Commission, are all moving in the direction of if you're going to get funding for your work, you've got to have your data open uh, access for other people to use. And so the frameworks are very much going to, for that, are going to be open frameworks with a knowledge base that allows you to query and pull out the relevant data and models for the questions you're asking. Um, but of course, there will be also proprietary, particularly individual data, which is owned by the individual for, for a human individual. Um, and then out of that, we have to be developing, you know, sort of work that you're doing, particularly with the Breast Project, being able to create anonymized versions of that individual data that then feed into virtual clinical um, trials type databases where you've anonymized, but there will still be proprietary elements in some of those. Um, but it's pulling data together from multiple individuals. So there's going to be a whole hierarchy, I think, of these different types of database with different levels of access control required. And I'm, I'm hoping you're going to tell us more about that in your next uh, seminar. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, Bruce. Bruce, go ahead, please. Yeah. Hi, Peter. Um, I've I've stated this before. I really like the um, the uh, approach whereby you retain key kinematic features of contraction in terms of that LV model. Just just one question, which is perhaps going back to the future in a way. I mean, is it is it possible to extend that to, for instance, a um, a confocal spheroid approach. Um, I don't realize that'll take more time. Yeah, um, you know, we're doing that, Bruce, absolutely. Providing you go down to a one dimension, providing the end result, whatever yeah. whatever symmetrical coordinate system you choose, whether it's cylindrical, spherical, prolate, spheroid, or oblate, for whatever it is, elliptical, providing in the end you're solving an equilibrium equation, which is a one dimensional equilibrium equation. Which, which that would be, very, yeah. Very fast. Um, that's that's the only requirement. So, yeah, if we are looking at um, spheroidal and prolate spheroidal frameworks as well, you'll you'll have to tell me 
how you're going to do the right ventricle, which is <laughs> which is just a little bit more complex, yeah. but maybe not as necessary, maybe not as uh, important. No, no, no. Of... I, I think it is important. It is very important. Well, especially for in terms of the patients. balance and what happens to the lungs, absolutely. But yeah, yeah. But yeah. I can I can quickly tell you, Bruce, how we're doing that. So it's it's the right ventricle is also treated as a cylinder, but it's wrapped onto the left vent cylindrical left ventricle. And then when you do your integration um, from a boundary condition on the, in the case of the LV, we're integrating from a zero external pressure through to the left ventricular cavity pressure. In the case of the right ventricle, we're integrating from left ventricular pressure through to right, through that septal wall, but you're using just a, a fraction of the cylinder for the right. So it's a cylindrical fraction superimposed onto a left ventricular cylinder, if you if you can find that. Yeah, no, I, I understand what you mean. And that could also be that could also be extended without yeah. without loss of uh, one dimensionality, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. It could, I mean I, I'm very, very keen and looking Mahir is in the process of working with some of Marty's data for mm. fitting the scaffolds to these large human MRI data sets. And I'm hoping that out of that will come as we do the as uh, the modal analysis is done and we begin to see what are the dominant modes of contraction all the way through the cardiac cycle, we can think about, okay, there's, there's quite apart from the cylindrical mode, there will be other modes that we might want to try and then capture an FTU to represent that mode and then combine the, the FTUs. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we probably have a question, um, time just for one or two questions. There's a, there's a question here, Chi Chow from Ruben and Addis about, um, um, are you looking for new researchers to join the project? Um, the answer is yes, very much um, so. We, we really want to engage with other people, both around New Zealand, within ABI, of course, and around New Zealand and internationally, who feel that they can benefit from and contribute to the project. I mean, obviously, the amount of money we have for this project um, for the ambition is extremely limited, but we think it is going to leverage a lot of other international opportunities. I mean, that's already starting to happen. Much, much bigger pots of money that will couple into 12 labors from international um, grant opportunities. So the answer is very much so. We're keen to, to hear from people who would like to couple in to the project. Yep, we probably just have, um, any other questions? Peter, probably just um, me. I'm, I'm, you know, I remember like uh, many years ago, you know, when Bruce we started doing the sheep uh, mapping the sheep atria. We only have animal study, uh, animal data. You know, that's clear. We make assumption for the modeling. Um, you know, now we actually has you know animal study. We also have clinical. You know, so from single cell to the tissue organ level, have many data. But somehow, um, it, it's you know more data somehow feel like really complex. Sometimes really hard. Uh, you know, actually know what's all these data. Um, you know, like a dog data, the human data would actually tell us a little, sometimes I actually find more challenging than actually just have simple data. Um, I'm not sure what I'm trying to ask. I'm just saying, any recommendation, just to say how we can, yeah. I, I totally agree, uh, Ji Chow. You know, very often it's, it's like the old story of it's much harder to write a, a short description of something than a long description. Um, and it's the same with modeling. I mean, it's, it's in many cases much harder to, to think about um, how you capture the key function that you care about in a physiological sense um, than it is to do a very detailed model where, but, but you need both. You need to be able to use the detailed model to inform the simpler model. But in a clinical setting, of course, we've got to get a lot better at asking very simple questions and knowing how to answer very simple questions, but with the depth of understanding that a physics approach brings. So you don't answer those simple questions in an empirical, just an empirical fashion. You answer them because you've got the benefit of physics to constrain the way that those solutions work. 
and, and physiology is in the essence a discipline built on physics. And it's got we've got to bring those physics tools to bear in a way that allows the simple questions to be answered, but with the depth of knowledge that comes through doing the very detailed modeling as well. Well, yeah, um, the charge, please, yeah. You risk the hand, right? Um, yeah, there's, can I just answer one from David? Uh, David oh, Bridges. Okay. Yeah. Multiscale yeah. models. Yeah. Uh, can you awesome. hear me? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Uh, my, my question is, how much is, uh, is uh, thought in advance? Well, I don't know if it's possible, but what I see is a very nice application of these models in teaching and also I would say in self-teaching whenever possible, because I see that uh, patients are more and more curious about how their body works. And I think it's an opportunity using, for example, a simple modeling of their own body to figure out uh, how right the concepts they have um, are of their uh, body functioning. And that could help also physiologists because we physiologists have a tendency to have an oversimplified view of uh, uh, what we are studying even when being specialists and we have a hard time moving from our simplistic conceptions to uh, more uh, realistic ones and it takes a long time and effort to to become uh, uh, integrative in 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 that uh, uh, not oversimplifying but having a, a, a framework for our understanding which is for our limited minds uh, much more limited than the capacities of our computers, uh, we we can uh, uh, still have a more uh, just representation and open to to integrating new things whenever we can. I think it's a new way of uh, of uh, learning science. I think, and and also uh, that is that is going on with the the fact that we are bound now to be more open minded and more multidisciplinary to the limitations of our uh, brain capacity of course <laughs> yeah I, I think those are really really great points and i totally agree with you i think this framework we we really want to i mean we've got to provide the depth of the maths and the physics so that the the modeling community is comfortable with what we're doing but we also have to provide um, interfaces into these modeling frameworks that can be used by physiologists for asking and answering specific physiological questions where, where people don't want to see all the, 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 the mathematical detail, but they want to be able to understand what these complex models are telling them in terms of, of physiological function. And we are actually beginning, we've got a NIH application in right at the moment, it's in its second round, um, which is, using a group at Case Western Reserve um, of um, postdocs and clinical fellows, in fact, to uh, test out the idea that we're, uh, this will be funded as a teaching program by NIH, which is going to be testing over the next year or two, testing the idea of using these frameworks for people that don't have that mathematical um, or physics background, but really want to use and contribute to the frameworks but are, are dealing with exactly those questions on physiology and even, even for individuals just understanding integrative function for one's own body. I think it's, it's a really important goal for the project. So thank you for asking that. You're welcome. If, if, if Peter, you. You, you, I see that that would just have a quick question. Maybe we'll just finish uh, um, this question. Um, from David? The, yeah, David, budget in the chat room, okay. yeah. I'll just, I've, I can see his question on chat. Um, so he's saying, what's my yeah, yeah. view on the availability of computation power versus computational need? I mean, I, um, I think our, you know, what we found over 20, 30 years of doing computational physiology is that computational power is never a limit. Um, every gain, you know, you know the, the gains in 
computational power that we can take advantage of as new chips become available and new types of computing becomes available are always way outweighed by the gain in, algor in algorithms. Um, so yes, we'll always keep taking advantage of the latest and greatest in terms of computational power, but that has never been a limitation. And I think it's, it's much more the algorithms that are the, the challenge, not the availability of compute power. Um, thank you very much, uh, Peter. I think uh, um, we run out of time. Um, I just a uh, final reminder is uh, you can always uh, um, ask questions or provide a comment for Peter talk. Uh, 